Hello, my name is Brooke Stanley. I'm a Coolidge Senator from the class of 2022 and a freshman at Milwaukee School of Engineering. We will now move to session four. The title of this session is Looking to the Future, Solutions to America's Debt Challenge. The moderator of this session will be Ambassador Richard Graber, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation. Mr. Graber previously served as the United States Ambassador to the Czech Republic. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Graber and our panelists to the stage. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Short story about Brooke before we get going. Uh, last year at this conference, uh, Brooke came up and introduced herself. She's from Milwaukee. The Bradley Foundation is Milwaukee, in Milwaukee, and she thought she'd say hi. And at that point in time, a couple of us from Bradley said, well, we're looking for a summer intern at Bradley Foundation this summer. Let us know if you know anyone, maybe your classmates, so forth. Well, Brooke went home and thought about it and raised her hand. And uh, Brooke was an outstanding intern at the Bradley Foundation last summer. <laughs> continues to work with us. She goes to school at the Milwaukee School of Engineering where she's taking organic chemistry and, and things like that that we political science majors never think of think about. Uh, she's going to go on to a career in, in medicine, but meanwhile she's working at the Bradley Foundation and we're just thrilled to have her. So, great story, small world. Uh, in any event, uh, as was mentioned, uh, this panel marks the culmination of uh, today's conference and, and now we're We've actually done it along the way, but, but we're really going to discuss the current situation, how we might go about improving it. Uh, as mentioned, the title of the panel is Looking to the Future, Solutions to America's Debt Challenge. We have a truly all-star uh, lineup of panelists today. Senator Joe Manchin, our fourth panelist, yeah. is not yet here. He's in a leadership meeting. We're hoping he gets here during the, the time. and. When he does get here, we'll let him. Senators remember. are always late. Senators are always late. <laughs> did, didn't run that way in the House, yeah. did it, yeah. Mr. Speaker? Mm -hmm. um, but first of all, let, let's remind ourselves and, and repeat what has already been said today, but remind ourselves of the situation we face today. Uh, total publicly held debt now exceeds $27 trillion. That's with a T. That's 12 zeros. That's a lot. That figure excludes the government's own internal debt, when the, that's when the government loans itself money from trust funds, that amount exceeds $7 trillion. Do the math, that's total debt greater than $34 trillion, which is more than our annual GDP of about $28 trillion. And in reality, the situation is even worse than that. The $34 trillion does not include the federal government's unfunded future liabilities. Cato Institute estimates that unfunded liabilities will be nearly $80 trillion over the next 75 years if adjustments are not made to entitlement spending. Of course, just servicing the debt has become a major, major cost. Data from the Congressional Budget Office suggests net interest on debt currently costs about $745 billion, or about as much as we spend on defense. In the future, even if interest rates stay right where they are, or low, debt service will eat up about 14% of the federal budget. But as you know, interest rates are more likely to go up than down, which means that we're sitting on a ticking time bomb. As you've heard, a 5% point uh, increase in interest rates would be nothing short of catastrophic. By 2033, net interest costs would be 31% of budget, it's more than our discretionary, discretionary spending, again, including defense. If interest rates go up 10 percentage points, then in 2033, debt service will cost more than entitlements. Entitlements, of course, include Social Security. So this isn't real complicated, but it's scary. And leaders uh, today could certainly learn some valuable lessons from President Coolidge. In 1921, when Warren Harding and Coolidge became president and vice president. They inherited a national debt that had risen, understandably, during World War I to $23.9 billion. By the time Coolidge left office in 1929, the publicly held debt of the United States was $17.3 billion. Hmm. Perhaps it's not surprising, given our debt situation today, that since the presidency of Calvin Coolidge, the percentage of debt to GDP has never been lower. 
Is it possible to rein in debt the way Coolidge once did? Our speakers today will have some really good ideas, so let's dive in. Our first speaker is Paul Ryan. Paul, as you all know, served as Speaker of the House of Representatives from 2015 to 2019. More importantly, he's a longtime friend from Wisconsin. No one knows better than Paul the realities of the political process in Congress and what's possible and what's not. Mr. Speaker. Hey, thank you, Rick. Five minutes, yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. yeah, five, okay. Thank you. Uh, being a house guy, I'm going to time myself so I don't go over a lot of time. I bet Joe Manchin won't do that when he gets here. I was just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Still got to trash talk the Senate. It just comes with me. Um, yeah, so I'll, let me just set the, I'll speak as a former chairman of the Budget Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. How's that sound? Um, I see friends like Chris Cox and John Childs and Jeb Henschling over here, guys I've worked with over the years um, on this issue. Um, this is the most predictable economic crisis we've ever had in this country. We all know it. We all see it coming. It's happening. And the question is, you know, exactly when is the inflection point? Nobody can answer that question. You call a bunch of bond traders and they'll give you their theories. You call a bunch of economists and they'll tell you this is the path we're on, how unsustainable it is. The problem we have is knowing that this is a problem, knowing it's coming, it's very predictable, knowing it does bad things for a country, our politics is so fundamentally unserious right now that we're just, we're incapacitated. We're not doing it. And hopefully there's some solutions here that, that point that way. Um, in the old days, like 10 years ago, <laughs> we used to make proposals to solve this problem that were fairly comprehensive. And there are different, you know, sides of the aisle that do this. I, I was just talking to my buddy Jeb over here. We put budgets out in the budget committee that he and I served on in 2007, through um, when we lost our majority in 2018, that were budget resolutions of the House that balanced the budget and paid off the debt. They raised the retirement age. They means-tested entitlements. They turned Medicare into premium support. They block-rented Medicaid. They showed with CBO, you know, baseline and scoring, you can do this. Uh, it takes a lot of political lift, though, to do it. Um, and I want to be—I want to watch my time. But in a nutshell, and I think what I was supposed to do was talk about what do you do. Steve's going to talk about monetary policy, right? And you're going to talk about um, how a commission would work. It's basically the entitlements. Uh, obviously, you need a discretionary spending cap so you have a budget for discretionary spending so that you know what that budget's going to be year in, year out. And it'd be nice to have that budget sort of set at the beginning of the year so you can actually have an appropriations process. There was an attempt at doing that this year that failed spectacularly. But, but that's easy, and discretionary spending's not the problem. It's the mandatory spending that Congress chooses whether or not to, to address any given year. And there are tools in the 1974 Budget Act, Reconciliation and others, that can be used to fix this problem. So I would argue that the congressional budget process is not very good, but it is usable. You don't have to rewrite the 74 Act to fix this problem. However, there are things you could do to the 74 Act to the way that modern budgeting works to make it easier to fix this problem. But putting those process reforms aside, which the guy who started that, that debate was Chris Cox back in the 90s, um, you do the following. You take your health care entitlement programs, and, and the, the, the quick consensus I'd say is, the, since this were at a Coolidge conference, the debates we had in America from Coolidge on till the end of the century were big debates over the Great Society, over the New Deal, and everything in between. I think I am safe to say that the social contract as we now generally describe it, health and retirement security and a safety net for those who slip through the cracks is something we all need, want, and want to preserve. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party aren't looking to abolish this. Republicans aren't running on getting rid of Medicare and health and retirement security. So knowing that we basically have consensus in this country on having this social contract, on having that social safety net, then the question is, since it was designed in the 20th century in ways that are totally unsustainable in the 21st century, because of the way these programs were designed then, what have we learned now in economics, in, in technology, to apply lessons to solve these problems so these missions can be still fulfilled without bankrupting the country? That's the key question. And, and the answer, many of us would say, is on the healthcare entitlement programs, the markets can do a lot. Private competition and choice can do a lot to make these programs work better, to deliver better services at lower costs, and you can convert these programs into effectively defined contribution programs that grow at fixed growth rates. 
Fixed growth rates, let's just say it's healthcare inflation. Pick your rate. That in and of itself can take the unfunded liability that these programs represent and wipe off trillions in unfunded liability on a real-time accrual basis. What I'm trying to say is you can grandfather the grandparents. You can grandfather existing seniors into the current programs and the current promises that were given to them that are unfundable right now, fund them, prospectively put reforms in that bring these programs, um, mostly it's the healthcare entitlement programs, and Social Security, very simple fix. We don't have to get into the details. It's, you can means test, you can change the age, you can do something on taxes. Um, my, my personal preference is get the markets involved, but a lot of different ideas there. The point being is Congress can still pass legislation that shows that in the future, as these reforms kick in, as people age into these new systems that are growing at set growth rates, that are harnessing the power of choice and competition and market delivery systems, getting better services at, 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 with better technology at lower costs, you can dodge the debt crisis. And I would argue the bond markets will reward you for doing that, even though the debt's still going to go up and up and up and up over the boomers, but it'll come down, 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 down once those defined benefit contribution or those defined contribution programs kick in. That's what we've always been able to show with these kinds of long-term budgets. That's what I think CBO and the markets will reward us with. That's how you'd step in front of a dollar crisis, a debt crisis, and that is effectively how you can solve this problem. The last thing I'll say um, on, on the substance of it is, is you can't really do any of this without economic growth. So don't kill your economy in the way to, on, the, on the path to doing this. So you got to be careful what you do on tax policy. you got to be careful what you do on growth policy. Um, and I won't get into the immigration because that's not the subject of the matter here, but you can pass reforms today that kick in in time that can solve this problem and dodge that debt crisis. So the question then is, what will force us to do this kind of political consensus? I did a premium support bill with Alice Rivlin and Ron Wyden, two Democrats that showed if you had passed this, you could solve the Medicare problem, take trillions of unfunded liability. So the question is, what will force us to get the political people in the room to do this? I think it's going to be more of an event. And my worry is it's going to be under the next presidency both of whom running for president, they're basically campaigning against solving this problem. They're campaigning against people who propose to solve this problem. So it's, we're not in a good place politically, and I'll, I think I'm getting to my five minute here. Um, we are probably gonna have an event, no one knows the answer to this when this happens, but it would not surprise me that after the Fed has done cutting interest rates, because going into an interest rate cutting environment, people are gonna make money on bonds, we're gonna sell our bonds. But after we're done cutting interest rates, when we are turning over all this debt, which is coming due with its term structure in the near future, when all the other first world countries are doing the same thing, because they too have unfunded entitlements and baby boomers, when you have all this sovereign debt coming into the markets, it would not surprise me if we have a few auction failures at the Treasury Department. And if we have a few auction failures at the Treasury Department, I don't know, 2025, 6, 7, what happens then? Does the, does the Fed step in and start buying those bonds? Do we truly start monetizing our debt? What happens to the dollar when that happens? What happens to interest rates? What are we going to have to pay in interest to get people to fill and complete those auctions that are failing? Those are the kinds of things that sort of scare me um, that are in the probably near future that could easily pop during this next presidency. And the question is, knowing that this is a likelihood, knowing that it's not a if question, it's a when question, what do we do now to get ready for it? It would be nice to get policymakers to start preparing these policy options so that they could pass these options sooner rather than later. And having said that, I think honestly the only way, and I never really liked commissions because I always thought it was Congress ducking its own responsibility, not doing its job. I think we're at that point where that's the only choice we got. We've got to have a commission with teeth. I know there are experts here who will talk about how best to do it for Congress to do that. And that's basically where I would, where I would end up at the end of the day. Great. Our second speaker is Steve Forbes. Uh, of course, you know all about Steve. He was also moderator of our last panel. Steve is the chairman of Forbes Media. Among other things, he will discuss the threat posed by competing currencies to the U.S. dollar. Steve. Uh, well, before beginning, uh, I'm not going to have a watch and time me. Um, doing my prerogative as a trustee. <laughs> <laughs> you object to Amity, I'll fire you. No. Uh, <laughs> But, but, but uh, uh, just a quick, quick bit of history. Back in I think it was uh, 2005, uh, Paul, as a congressman, 
came up with a proposal to deal with Social Security. And the way he uh, did the numbers was to confound the critics was he used non-dynamic scoring from a CBO. And I thought this was pretty good, pretty good thinking to uh, solve the problem. Uh, so I wrote about it, talked about it, and I got a call from a certain aide in the White House who appears on Fox every now and then, uh, beating my brains in, saying this is the most reckless political thing, blah, 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 blah. You, what, what are you doing undermining the administration? Then, of course, a short while later, they came out with their own proposal, proposing cuts to people. And uh, you saw how far that went. So uh, in that sense, uh, Paul was well ahead of his time. If we had done that uh, in uh, 2005, uh, we wouldn't be having this on the panel today. So let's give a little hand for a guy who uh, saw this uh, years ago and proposed it. <laughs> What I'm going to do today, even though there are uh, solutions, Paul has alluded to some of them, in terms of uh, dealing with this problem, I'm going to focus on something that amazingly gets little attention, especially from central bankers, and that is the need, if you're going to have sustained economic growth over time, and that is the need for a stable value for the dollar. Uh, money is like a claim check. You know, you check your coat, what do you get? A piece of plastic piece of paper, worthless in and of itself, but a claim on a real product. You buy a ticket to an event, whether it's a piece of paper or an ellipse on your handheld, worthless in and of itself, but a claim on a real event. Money is simply claim checks in the marketplace for all the products that you want to sell. So in that sense, money is a measure of value. It's not a commodity, it's a measure of value, like a scale measures weight, clock measures time, ruler measures space. And so that value should not change. It should be constant, just like you don't float the number of minutes in an hour. Imagine if the Federal Reserve was in charge of the clock, <laughs> the Time Bureau, and uh, it, it would be chaos. Imagine baking a cake. It says, bake the batter 30 minutes. And uh, you wonder, are those nominal minutes? Are those <laughs> inflation-adjusted minutes in New York minutes? <laughs> it would be chaotic. But the same thing in a, in a very different slow motion way is what happens in the marketplace when you have unstable money. And in the early 70s, after we went off the Bretton Woods uh, gold standard, you look at the average growth rate since then. For 180 years, we had the highest growth rates in human history through civil war, depressions, uh, world wars and the like, controversies no end politically. Uh, we had a very good average growth rate, depending on how you measure it, three and a quarter, three and a half percent. Since then, it's declined, and you take that decline, half to one percent, and compound it over half a century, the results are devastating. When you have unstable money, you get less long-term investment. When anyone ever asks, should you invest in gold, uh, I know we have a problem. Uh, gold is an insurance policy. It's not really investment. It's an insurance policy against the depredations of government. Governments do to currencies what airlines do to frequent miles. They, they, they always uh, de de degrade them. And, and, and so, and so, uh, and so in term, term, terms of the money, uh, when you have unstable money, you take the uh, median household income, depending on whose numbers you use, about $75,000, $78,000 today. And uh, if you had had normal growth rates that we had for 180 years through all this turbulent history, uh, that uh, median income, household income would be about $115,000, $120,000. Don't you think people would be a little happier today with $40,000 extra income? Uh, than what we have now. Over time, the cumulative impact is devastating. And unfortunately, uh, so how do you get a stable currency? Uh, one is the, what we did for 180 years in various ways, the gold standard. Uh, there's probably more myths about the gold standard. You know, it causes baldness, it uh, wrecks your car, <laughs> makes your dog itch, and all that kind of stuff. More, more myths about it. We covered it in our book, Inflation, but uh, myths about it. So we're not going to go anytime soon uh, to the gold standard because even if the people said we should do it, they wouldn't know how to do it. And they demonstrated that by how they ran the Bretton Woods system. When after the war, we had over half the gold in the world and wrecked the, and re ended up wrecking the system. Whereas Britain, with a fraction of it before World War I, when they knew what they were doing, uh, they ran a pretty good uh, international monetary system. It was, uh, by historic standards, a, a outstanding success. The other way, at least in the short term, is have the Fed go back to uh, what they did in, from the mid-80s to the late-90s, what you might call a sloppy gold standard, where they looked at commodity prices, they looked at gold prices. Greenspan said he looked at the gold price. 
So it wasn't a real gold standard, but at least they were looking to see what the marketplace was saying about the value of the dollar. So you had uh, so somewhat stability, and there was a pretty good growth period. Then, unfortunately, Greenspan forgot about it, uh, tightened up in the late 90s, and then went uh, in the opposite direction in the early 2000s, and we saw where that led. Oil goes from $20 a barrel to $80, $80, $80 a barrel by the time 2007, 2008 rolls around. Commodity prices all go up. We saw the subprime housing crisis, and uh, we had the disaster uh, that we bemoan here today. So in terms of uh, the thing, the key thing is the Federal Reserve should, uh, one, stop trying to manipulate the growth of the economy. Russia couldn't do it very well with the command economy. How in the world can a few Fed governors and 300 PhDs in, in, in Washington do the same thing? Leave it alone. The economy is big enough to take care of itself. It'll get in trouble from time to time, but it'll self-correct. One of the books uh, I hope our young people read is uh, by Jim Grant, who some of us heard last night, called The Forgotten Depression of 1920-21. And uh, it was savage. It was a real harsh downturn, far worse than the beginnings of the Great Depression of uh, 1929. Uh, what did the government do? Slash spending got rid of all wartime controls, cut taxes. Uh, Herbert Hoover, who was a Commerce Secretary, th said, this is terrible. We're not doing anything to fight this downturn. Uh, we need a more active government. Uh, but he was ignored. And as a result, the Depression was very short-lived, and within a short period of time, we had full employment. You can read Amity's book, The Forgotten uh, Man, about uh, what all the activism did in the 30s. Short-term answer, short answer is, didn't work. And, uh, and so in, ter in terms of uh, the Fed, uh, they should move away and be banned from using the Phillips curve, which posits that there's a direct correlation between inflation and unemployment. Experience shows that's garbage, uh, including what's happened recently. We've had low unemployment, and inflation's come down. We did the same thing in the 80s. But nonetheless, that kind of mentality is wholly writ. So you look at all the central bankers in the world, they all talk about trying to control the growth of the economy, as if you working is somehow bad for, uh, for, for inflation. Inflation, monetary inflation, not non-monetary, like when you have a, a lockdown, which sends up prices because nobody's producing anything. But non-monetary, uh, monetary inflation, basic definition is lowering the value of the currency, the dollar, usually by creating too many of them. Very, very basic. So if the Federal Reserve would just simply, and by the way, this control of interest that everyone seems to accept as normal is a form of rent control. Uh, we all know rent control for apartments and buildings is no good. Rent control of money, you used to call it, rent, cool, make reference to renting the money. And uh, so the, the rent control has grossly distorted the markets today. Uh, we see it, why are short-term rates higher than uh, long-term rates? That's good for big borrowers, but it's devastating for small businesses, as I, as I alluded to. And uh, so the, the, the Fed has been distorting the markets for over 10 to 12 years. Uh, since the crisis of 2008-2009. Uh, and as a result, you had these uh, crazy situations like Apple, the biggest money producer in the world, at least until recently, uh, borrowing money, floating bonds, uh, to, to taking on debt, $100 billion of debt. Uh, why? Because it was money, they're giving away the money. If you had any interest, they could deduct it. So why would Apple be borrowing uh, these vast sums of money? Big companies could vast, uh, borrow vast sums of money. Governments loved it because it was painless borrowing. Like having your credit card charging 10000 your monthly payment goes down with, the, with, with zero interest rates. So key thing is go for a stable dollar. If the Fed announced that in the future they feel the best way to get decency on prices a decent economy where you can get full employment, however you define it, uh, moving target it seems, but anyway, full employment. Uh, if they announced that in the future the best way to do that, as David alluded to his lunch today, uh, you would see a whole different psychology in the marketplace. You would see you could allow long-term, uh, short-term interest rates <coughs> to decline, not have everyone fear, oh, the Fed's going to repeat what they did in the 70s and declare victory too soon, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what cures, what cures in inflation is not austerity. Any, 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 uh, when you conquer inflation, any uh, turbulence you get is from companies having to adjust for a world where they thought prices were going to go up 10% a year to where they're not going up 10% a year. And uh, so it's not the austerity per se. And by the way, in the 80s, 
we had certain sectors of the economy like uh, oil and uh, uh, agriculture that were in a virtual depression, the rest of the economy did very well. So the key thing the Fed should do is say stable uh, value for the dollar and uh, also stop manipulating interest rates. No more rent control and let the economy take care of itself. And if you have a crisis, like a, a war or a disease or something, yeah, the Fed steps in. The Brits taught us back in the 1860s, a lender of last resort, uh, where you uh, do, do take emergency measures, and then you back off. The Fed did not back off uh, catastrophically after 2008. And by the way, it's been alluded to in terms of what the Fed has done, and they've got to, we've got to prevent it in the future. When they bloat their balance sheet, as they did starting after 2009, that is a seizure of assets, controlling uh, assets, upwards of nine trillion. It's come down a little bit uh, since, since the height. But that sort of nationalization, control, indirect control, modern socialism, modern socialists learn you don't seize assets. All you have to do is regulate the asset, regulate businesses, regulate personal lives. And it's uh, much more lethal. So in terms of uh, the monetary thing, uh, Fed should step back, stable, stable, stable currency, and let interest rates go down. So when people say, should the Fed reduce interest rates, I say yes, but combine it, it must be combined with a stable dollar. Then it will work. As for cryptos, crypto was invented as a high-tech cry for help uh, <laughs> with, 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 with a bit, Bitcoin, uh, and, uh, but they made the big mistake was thinking by making it uh, uh, fixing the supply of Bitcoin, that would make it function like money, you know, controlling the money supply. They forget. It's not the money supply per se. It's whether people trust you're uh, preserving the value of the currency. And when you see the, vol the volatility with Bitcoin, that's not money. A speculative vehicle, yes. But you would never, ever take a mortgage in Bitcoin. Imagine you did that a year ago. Instead of a $200,000 mortgage, you owe the bank about a million dollars today. And not, not, not a currency, especially for long-term contracts. I'm amazed that uh, cryptos haven't been yet invented. That uh, would be very easy. Uh, the time will come uh, where cryptos will be an alternative uh, currency to government, which is going to be a very interesting political mm -hmm. battle, uh, where people feel safe to using a certain uh, crypto for, uh, for transactions, including long-term transactions. So the key thing is trust. If you look at the money supply and closing of the 1970s, it didn't go up that much. But the problem was people lost faith that the government knew how to manage the currency. Reference was made earlier to 1961, trying to manipulate the gold market uh, instead of uh, just focusing on a stable dollar by uh, uh, changing the size of your uh, balance sheet. And the way you do that is... Uh, uh, currency and circulation and bank reserves. Now you have to add reverse repos. But uh, uh, keep, keep a stable dollar, uh, keep a stable price of gold, it would have worked. Instead, they did a lot of other junk. So uh, people lost faith. In closing, the Sw if you look at this money supply of the, of the Swiss franc of Switzerland, you'd think they might have, must have a hyperinflation. No, uh, because people trust the Swiss franc because for 100 years it's kept its purchasing power better than any other currency in the world. So it's got a huge supply because people want it. Canada, by contrast, several times the size of Switzerland, uh, their money supply is actually less than Switzerland's because <clears throat> who wants the loony or you know, the Canadian dollar? Uh, Canadians are forced to use it, but it's, it's not, not something that has great international currency because people don't trust it the way they do the Swiss franc. So even though there are other solutions that have to be done, Paul has touched on them and uh, to, to get control of the spending, the fact of the matter is we've got to have key is a stable dollar. It worked since Hamilton recognized it. Time we get that part of Hamilton back again. Thank you. Our third speaker is Romina Baccia. Romina is Director of Budget and Entitlement Policy at the Cato Institute, where she specializes in federal spending, budget process, economic implications, of rising debt and entitlement reform. Romina. Thank you, Rick. Before I dive in, oh. you might turn my phone. 
All right, I think I'm on now. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for the introduction. Before I dive in, I want to just take a moment to say what a joy it is to be on this panel with these titans of public policy. In, uh, in 2011, when I was uh, at the Heritage Foundation, my very first project was the Stable Dollar Conference, working together with Steve. And my very first paper for Heritage was debunking myths about Ryan's house budget plan. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this is fantastic, and I hope That's that Senator Manchin will be able to join us because now it's my pleasure to work with Congress to shape the contours of a fiscal commission to stabilize our debt, which I believe is the most feasible and promising solution to addressing the, the problems that you heard about so much uh, throughout this day. Um, earlier, Rick mentioned that uh, our unfunded obligations are close to $80 trillion over the next 75 years. That's the difference between what the government is projected to spend and what the government will collect in taxes under current policies, and this is without considering interest costs, which, by the way, are a major driver of our, our debt now. Um, but what's important to understand about these unfunded obligations, coming back to something uh, Paul Ryan said earlier, discretionary spending is not the problem. It, it truly isn't because 100% of our unfunded obligations are due to Medicare and Social Security. 100%. In fact, it's more than 100% because there is a surplus of about 7% in the non-entitlement budget over the, the 75 year period that slightly reduces the unfunded obligations for Medicare and Social Security. What that means is that there's no way we can address our debt crises unless we address the growth in Medicare and Social Security. Because left on autopilot, the projected growth in spending on these programs threatens to burden not future generations, but current uh, and younger generations with insurmountable debt, economy crushing tax hikes to address that debt, uh, or the black swan threat of an unprecedented US fiscal crisis. And we're at a time now where we cannot afford to ignore this reality any longer. We need a new approach. Because over the past 15 years, um, we have witnessed se several attempts at tackling the entitlement-driven spending challenge. We've witnessed congressional leadership proposing specific solutions. We've seen several fiscal commissions come and go without me making meaningful progress. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that history in a bit. However, there is one approach that Congress has not yet tried. And this is modeling a fiscal commission after the successful Base Realignment and Closure Commission um, or BRAC. BRAC was a process that um, existed to identify obsolete military bases following the Cold War. It established an independent commission to help Congress overcome the apparently intractable political problem, similar to entitlements today, of making decisions that involve concentrated costs for dispersed benefits. At the time, it was clear pretty much everyone, the public, Republicans and Democrats, that keeping costly military bases that were no longer serving the US government open was contrary to the national interest. And yet, legislators would fight tooth and nail when it came to identifying specific bases to close. So they established BRAC to help them overcome this problem. BRAC succeeded, and it saved federal taxpayers billions of dollars. Now, I'm proposing that we take the BRAC, Base Realignment and Closure Process, concept and apply it to resolving America's fiscal challenge. I believe this is an innovative, not yet tried approach that holds immense promise in surmounting what amounts to a political problem primarily uh, that has plagued past entitlement reform efforts and keeps Congress in gridlock today. But what makes this commission different from other commissions that Congress has tried? Let's try to break it down. First, a BRAC-like commission would consist primarily, if not solely, of independent experts, individuals unencumbered by partisan affiliations. Congress could then point fingers uh, and say, these experts made these recommendations, they're economically necessary, despite being politically unpopular, um, but they have a scapegoat. Second, the commission would stabilize the debt by ensuring that spending and revenue policies keep debt from exceeding our gross domestic product. That is the current approach where Congress is trying to stabilize debt 
at no more than 100% of GDP. But the importance there is that Congress would set those broad parameters, stabilize the debt, but the details of how to accomplish that will be left up to the commission. Third, the commission should be empowered with fast track authority. Instead of expediting the commission's plan, which is what we saw with uh, previous congressional commissions, uh, thereby putting politicians on the record for having to vote affirmatively for any proposals before they can go into effect, a BRAC plan should be self-executing. Unless Congress leveraged expedited procedures to vote it down, it would go into effect automatically. That provides the political cover to let those changes go into effect, uh, uh, because I don't think it's going to happen if members of Congress have to actually vote for uh, benefit changes or, uh, or, or the uh, uh, other changes that would be related to, the, to it. And I think this is the crucial twist that we're missing from the current um, effort in Congress to set up a, uh, a, a fiscal commission. It's the linchpin of my BRAC proposal that commission recommendations would be self-executing. You heard that right. I am suggesting that unless Congress explicitly objects, the commission's proposal should take effect automatically, and I believe that this is essential. Because legislators, not Paul Ryan, but most other legislators, uh, obviously shy away from making decisions that create obvious winners and losers uh, because they would like to be reelected. Um, with a self-executing mechanism, they can advocate passionately for their constituents while simultaneously allowing necessary policy solutions to take effect. In this way, a BRAC-like commission paradoxically empowers legislators to be both advocates for their constituents and stewards of the whole nation. They become champions for their communities, which is what they're good at, um, and they can blame politically unpopular outcomes on commission experts. I would gladly take the blame. <laughs> so I believe that a BRAC-like fiscal commission transcends politics, elevates Congress, and provides a workable path to secure fiscal stability, securing the very foundation of a strong and prosperous America. I believe this commission can work where others have failed. If we think back uh, to 2010 and where we, where we are now, over the past 15 years, we've witnessed uh, President Obama establishing the Simpson-Bowles Commission in 2010. Congress and the President felt pressure then to address uh, the debt because stimulus spending had failed at reigniting the American economy, but had succeeded in driving up the national debt. The President didn't put his executive support behind the recommendations, but I'm not so sure that even if President Obama had supported the Simpson-Bowles plan, if it could have survived an affirmative vote in Congress. Then in 2011, we have um, Paul Ryan serving as chairman of the House Budget Committee, and he actually proposed bold solutions, including Medicare premium support, which you mentioned earlier, uh, to address the biggest drivers of debt head on. He's a visionary leader, and he was vehemently attacked for it. 2011, we have the Budget Control Act um, that also failed, set up a special super committee, and put in place automatic cuts to try and force a solution. That effort failed, too. I think one of the lessons we learned is that leadership on entitlements cannot be confined to one party or one chamber, not even in the face of automatic spending cuts. And uh, so we need a new approach. Fast forward to today. I hope Senator Manchin will show up soon. <laughs> um, Senator, the Senator has shown remarkable leadership. Uh, he's advocated for a bipartisan bicameral fiscal commission, the so-called Trust Act, which would have addressed Medicare's and Social Security's solvency, and this proposal garnered significant bipartisan support. However, I believe that making that commission explicitly about reforming entitlements and relying solely on members of Congress to staff the commission and also requiring an affirmative vote on any final recommendations was unlikely to work. Uh, more recently, together with Senator Mitt Romney, uh, Senator Manchin has championed the Fiscal Stability Act. And this is a bill where there's uh, a bill in the House called the Fiscal Commission Act and now a bill in the Senate. They look very similar, which I think is a good sign that uh, this approach has a chance of passing in this uh, Congress. Uh, these uh, bills would establish a bipartisan fiscal commission 
guided by outside experts, but only members of Congress would be voting members to stabilize the economy, uh, the debt at uh, no more than 100% of the economy over the next 15 years. So it's not just about reforming entitlements, it's focused on addressing the broader debt challenge. I think that's important. It's, it's vaguer than reforming entitlements, and that makes this a stronger approach because it's less prone to political attack. Uh, I believe the Fiscal Stability Act is a promising step toward taking another crack at fixing our debt challenge. At the very least, it will reignite a public debate about the key drivers of our fiscal challenge and the programs that are at the core of it. But I'm afraid it's no brack. I don't believe a fiscal commission can succeed unless Congress has the necessary political cover to reform entitlements, which means that uh, members of Congress should be further removed from commission proceedings and ideally would not have to take a public vote to enact the commission's recommendations. And on that, I want to rep uh, quote uh, Representative John Kyle from Arizona, who uh, said this about BRAC during discussions uh, uh, in the House of Representatives during the 100th Congress, quote, I do not think we are fooling anyone when we say we are all for closing obsolete bases, but then we attach so many preconditions that we know we're never going to end up closing any bases. One of these is the difference between automatic closure and the provision that would require Congress to affirmatively act. Who among us believes that we will actually close bases if we have to affirmatively act? End quote. And I think Representative John Kyle hit the nail on the head here, and what he said about military bases is also true about entitlement reform. And I'll leave you with that. Our best hope in addressing our debt crisis before it's too late is in members of Congress acknowledging that they abdicated their responsibilities to control the growth in federal spending a long time ago when they put entitlements on autopilot. So rather than viewing the delegation to an independent BRAC-like fiscal commission to fixing this problem as further application of Congress's responsibility. They should see it as a way to reclaim that responsibility by putting in place a workable mechanism to get the job done. Thank you. All right, yeah, uh, I'll ask one real quick question, and then uh, let's turn to audience questions, particularly students. This is a great opportunity for you, so be thinking of some questions. But very quickly, Romina, it seems to me that your commission idea at some point along the, the process will require bipartisan buy-in. Is that possible in today's world? And Paul, I mean, you propose reasonable solutions to entitlement reform your whole career in Congress. You got clobbered unfairly, but you got clobbered. Uh, how do you sell the public on tweaking, reforming um, entitlements in general? Romina first. Romina first. Okay. Then I'm much audience. more optimistic uh, now than I have been since basically 2011, when I think we're all very optimistic as well. Um, and that is because we've already seen a development uh, moving from the Trust Act towards the Fiscal Stability Act. And I think that's a very good sign because uh, what, we, what the development is that there's been an expansion in the commission member composition to include um, outside experts. That's a good sign. Um, we're focused on stabilizing the debt as a whole rather than um, just addressing the uh, solvency of uh, Medicare and Social Security because we face a broader debt challenge, especially since so much of uh, Medicare is already funded uh, through general revenues, not the trust fund. Um, and so there's bipartisan support for this approach right now. Where Congress is not quite yet comfortable is um, going further and saying, we're going to delegate more of this to an outside commission. And also, we're not going to take an up or down vote where I see uh, a proposal like this likely failing, especially in, uh, in today's polarized environment. Um, so it's possible that maybe we need one more failed commission before members of Congress finally see the light of day. 
Um, I would be, uh, it would be very unfortunate if we waited until the 2030s when Medicare and Social Security trust funds will become insolvent because the issue is that if we wait that long, the debt will be that much bigger, our interest costs will be that much higher, it'll be so much tougher to dig out of this problem, and many of the solutions that we could face in gradually where we could actually protect especially the most vulnerable seniors from any reductions in their benefits um, will have expired. So gradual changes, we can make those now, but the longer we wait, uh, the more severe changes will have to be. Um, so I'm optimistic, but it might, it, might, it might take one more failed commission and then we'll do it the right way. Um, I'd say, uh, yes, I got clobbered, but um, I did pass it four times out of the House. Uh, everybody voted for premium support for Medicare means testing and for lifting the retirement age, and they all lived to tell about it. We never lost a majority over that. Difference is, is presidential leadership. You've got to have air cover from the top to push these things through. Um, I'll just give you a couple quick examples. Um, Bush gets reelected in 04, uh, did not campaign on this issue, campaigned understandably so on terrorism and the rest. Then John Kerry goes to Faneuil Hall, concedes Ohio the, the Wednesday after the election. Then Bush goes to the Reagan building down here, the, you know, next to the Commerce Department declares victory and says, I want to do medic, uh, Social Security reform and tax reform. First time he mentioned it. He didn't mention it before <laughs> during the election. Um, and I thought we should have done tax reform first, get some growth, then do Social Security reform. We had different uh, 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 agreements on that. But we all pushed for Social Security reform. We had different versions. That's for, Steve's correct about that. Back when we had surpluses, we could have used those for personal accounts. Would have made a world of difference. We don't have those surpluses anymore. I digress. But, but you had Bush pushing at least for Social Security reform at the time, um, didn't run on it, so he didn't claim to have the mandate, but nevertheless was pushing it in a second term. We had an agreement with our leadership. I was a backbencher in those days. After we get back from the August recess to put our Social Security reform bill on the floor and get this thing moving. What happened that August? Katrina. Hurricane Katrina comes and it blew all of us. <laughs> it blew the legislative agenda out the window. Circumstances overtake, took things. We never got the light of day. So circumstances overtook that moment. Okay, let's go forward. And then I started passing budgets after that. Um, we passed again four years in a row in 2011 you know, through 2014, these, these budget plans. Obama demagogued them wildly. You know, that's where they throw this, this ad of me pushing grandma off a cliff. I had eight co-sponsors to begin with. Jeb Hensling was one of them. We ended up passing it through our majorities but we had total demagoguery from the White House. So we just couldn't get these things over the finish line. Um, but Mitt put me on the ticket after I put, proposed these budgets, thinking, heck, I'm gonna have to defend your budget anyway. I might as well have you on the <laughs> ticket with me. So, you know, we, we, we had a plan to get this place, but we, we lost the White House. We didn't get it. And Obama, um, who, I was on Bull Simpson with Jeb and Dave Camp. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeb, but if I'm not mistaken, in the last meeting, and we had our problems with Bull Simpson. I won't get into the substance of it. In the last meeting of Bull Simpson, we we're all shaking everybody's hands. Nice to meet with you. Enjoy these last six months. Before we left the room in the last meeting of the Bull Simpson Commission, the press releases were handed to us from Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama saying, we're not doing this. <laughs> we're against it. It was dead already. It was because in a commission like that, it's, it, 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 they didn't have to vote on it. Congress, the speaker could decide yes or no. She told us no before we even left the room. So you can't have a commission like that, to your point, Romina. Um, you got to have presidential leadership. Um, and then ever since then, you know, we've been trying to pass these budgets, but you've had everybody running for president afraid of this issue, not running on it. I really, truly believe the way to get this done is to run on fixing these problems in an election so that if and when you win that election, you have earned the moral authority and the mandate to actually put that in place and to do it. Um, that's what we have not had. And right now, we clearly, clearly do not have that. So I think the last chance, the best case, is, is, is a commission like Romina is describing. Great. Your questions? Yeah. Students, let's go right here first, and then we'll go over right there. Thank you. My name is Patrick Bernal from New Jersey. Um, two kind of related questions. Um, uh, sorry, I'm sorry if I butcher, uh, butcher your name. Is it Ms. Boccia? Um, I think she made some really interesting points. So um, I guess my question for the other panelists is, do you agree that the debt crisis a, is primarily a political issue? And uh, what is your opinion on Ms. Boccia's uh, BRAC plan? 
I was personally really enamored by it, but I want to know if you guys had any, um, you could foresee any issues or potential problems with that kind of commission. Thank you. Steve, you want to go or you want to? Well, on the BRAC plan, I think, uh, like most things, uh, the public has to marinate on it for a while. Uh, events will uh, be very determinative. Uh, the speaker mentioned what happened in 05 with Katrina. Back in the late 90s, there was a serious effort by Bill Clinton to do something on Social Security. He lined up and Pat Medicare. Moynihan and, and Medicare. Medicare. Uh, John Bro, a yeah. sensible Democrat from Louisiana, was all lined up, ready to go, and then along came Monica, and suddenly, <laughs> and, and, and suddenly it became batten the hatches, circle the wagons, disasters at hand, and the thing, and the thing died. But uh, twice, uh, things were, were close to getting something done, positive, and twice uh, events uh, intervened. And uh, sort of what Lincoln said during the Civil War, he said, uh, events have controlled me more than I've controlled events. And uh, so in terms of the commission, I think uh, the public has, has to build up, get familiar with it like most things, marinate on it, discuss it, debate it. And then I think you also get from that ideas on what to do about uh, the, the, the current uh, situation. One of the things that holds hope for uh, health care, including Medicare, are uh, health savings accounts properly done. Amazingly, the corporate world has now put in insurance policies with high deductibles, high co-pays. People are now paying out of pocket more than ever before. They want to know what things now cost. Mm -hmm. You're starting to see emerging of a, of a uh, uh, private market, real commercial market. If you want to get an idea of how that might work, uh, there's a go online to uh, sesamecare.com. And you'll see uh, Dr. Zilch, 50% off for a knee exam on, on Friday. Uh, real, 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 real uh, markets starting to emerge. And companies should be encouraged to get away from this model they have now to where people get accustomed to uh, getting information, making choices, deciding what kind of policies. So you get a real individual market emerging again. I think that'll go a long way. And on uh, Medicare, I think uh, the OCID is brooded about for a new part of Medicare with a real health savings account where a couple might get 10,000 deposit in the account. You can't take away the rest of Medicare. You say this is purely voluntary. You want it, you can have it. But I think uh, the whole BRAC debate will come up with some ideas where people will become less fearful that it's just going to be, I'm losing. No, uh, some positive things might emerge, including maybe even some private accounts. So uh, the more discussion there is, the better. And, uh, and hopefully uh, that, uh, that'll come to pass. And then just take one crisis. A few was mentioned earlier, bond failures, auction bond failures. Uh-oh. Uh, we need to start doing some serious thinking. Yes, yeah, Steve's right. The, the, the Bro Frist Thomas Commission had um, Social Security reform, Medicare premium support reform. If, if it was, bit, we wouldn't be talking about this today. This conference wouldn't exist if that happened, and it did. It's what it, the, the impeachment of Trump, of, of, excuse me, the impeachment, there's a lot of Trump impeachments. The impeachment <laughs> of, of Clinton knocked that one off, off the front page, and it, and it killed it from happening. And, and from all intents and purposes, we thought Clinton was going to lean into that. So moments have ta overtaken events. Um, this is one of those deals where an event may overtake the moment, which is like the bond failure and the debt crisis. Um, I wrote the HSA law. That's an amendment I passed to the, um, to the 03 Medicare bill. I'll just digress for just a quick second. Our, our thinking at the time was to get health insurance to a high deductible uh, health insurance plan with consumers spending their pre-tax dollars underneath to bring a consumer into the marketplace and then to do other things in Medicare and the rest to bring market economics and market discipline into the healthcare sector, which is the best way of taming inflation in healthcare. Those proposals are still there. You can still do that. So, they're, so it really is a matter of political will. We know what to do to fix these problems. And, and I would argue you could build a left of center and right of center coalition to do this. I think you could get Democrats and Republicans. We, Republicans, agree, concede. We, want the, we agree with the social contract. We're not going to relitigate the New Deal. Democrats have to, liberals have to agree the market's going to be involved in this. It's not going to just be a government-run program. It's got to be private sector solutions, delivery mechanisms within the proper parameters. If they concede that and we concede this, you can get something done. And I think there are proposals that do this. 
So then it comes down to your question of what's the best forcing mechanism? Um, on, on, on Romina's bill, um, the tough vote's the first vote, right? So it's where do you wanna, as a guy who counted votes for a long time, where do you wanna put, where's the tough vote? In her approach, it's up front of just creating this thing because if it self-executes, then it's more likely than not that it takes place and you don't have to grab the gory details. You're just doing, I wanna solve the problem and be amorphous about what the solution is. So to, to her credit, that, that puts the tougher but easier vote on the front end. Um, and either way, you're better off if you fast track it. If you make Congress vote on it and have to have the vote and you can't filibuster and duck it, that's a, process, that's a step in the right direction, unlike Simpson Bowles. So you're already in a better category with the design of that policy that way. The, the, the thing that I hesitate, and I'd, I'd want to think about this more is, and I'd be curious what Jeb or Chris, the guys who served with me in Congress in the room, think about this is, um, I, I mean, I got BRAC. I, I lost a base in Milwaukee in BRAC, a, a fighter wing, um, you know, and I blame BRAC. <laughs> you know, that's just kind of how it works in those days. Um, so that's true. That does work. But on Medicare and Social Security, it's, it's pretty inconceivable to me that you would not have that vote of disapproval. It's, it's inconceivable that, that you, nobody in Congress would say, no, we're not going to get you have that vote. You're going to have that vote. So I think you'll have that vote anyway. And, and the vote would be to disapprove of it. And I don't know if it's that much of a different vote, approval, disapproval. However you vote is going to affect what happens, and you're going to get blamed as a politician for the vote no matter what. So let's just say I'm not going to vote to disapprove this cut to Medicare benefits or Social Security benefits you're still going to get the ads run against you. You're still going to get blamed. So I think it's, it's almost the same thing as it's, it's probably what you're doing is you're shifting, you know, the, the, the crescendo to the end and you're making it probably more likely that you get to the end. That's probably what you achieve with that um, versus the other commission approaches. And the farther you get down the path to an end solution, the better you are. So you're going to have that vote of, 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 non-committal that, that vote in the house and the senate no matter what i think and the question is it, do events like steve and i were just describing are events such that it is really truly critical members can honestly say we have a crisis in front of us and if we do not solve this problem it's going to be real bad collateral damage the dollar your benefits the benefit cuts that's what they have to measure it against so that's the only thing that I think solves this, which is a politician can say it is, it, is, it is chaos or this plan that you don't like, but that's better than this chaos. I'm going with this plan. That's basically how you defend it. And by, by the way, um, if you want to see how the future will look as this consumerism starts to take hold, is uh, go online and look up the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. Uh, they uh, do all sorts of surgeries, board-certified surgeons. The amazing thing is they, one, post all prices online in advance so you don't get bills three years from now. But the key thing is there's no insurance. You pay with cash. You pay up front. And uh, you think, oh, this is terrible. But their costs for a procedure is about 25, 30 percent of what a typical hospital charges. And people find they end up saving money, even though they have, may have had the company insurance, by going to the surgery center. That kind of innovation, I think you're going to see more of getting a real consumer market, which crashes those unfunded liabilities once patients have the power to police the market like they do everywhere else. We are sadly having to come to the end of our panel here. Uh, Senator Manchin, as I understand it, is on his way. Students will be given an opportunity to ask the senator questions. Uh, this has been a wonderful day. Let me just close with three very, very quick thoughts. One, this is a very real problem. Two, the task is daunting. And three, if we're to preserve this exceptional, unique, amazing land of opportunity, we simply have to meet and beat this challenge. Thanks so much for the day. Thanks for participating.